and welcome to another episode of Captured by Women. This is a current affairs program that looks at critical issues from the perspective of women. My name is Nancy Vukania and I'm a management consultant. I'm here in studio with my co-host, Matilda Abahins, a communications expert. This show is brought to you by Raid Mosquito Repellent Day and Night Spray, Emerald Sweets and Woudine. Woudine, Le Createur. We're all wearing a beautifully sewn Woudine. My garment is by Milike Garments in Dakoman. And uh, Matilda? Dash Fashion from Tabora Alaji. All right, so you heard it. Go and get your own Woudine. In this episode, we will first of all speak to a national executive of the Ghana National Association of Teachers regarding uh, the illegal strike action by some of their members. And we also have Herbert Krapa, government spokesperson on governance and legal affairs, speaking to the issue of allegations of corruption against some officials of government and investigations that have been conducted by reports not published. On the spin, we will look at the EC's decision to reduce the voting time and um, now institute a new time to start at 7 a.m. in the morning and end at 4 p.m. in the evening. We will look at all these issues in detail. Welcome again to Captured by Women. Up next is Spin. All right, so Matilda, you know um, the EC has plans to change the voting time. So um, uh, there have been many mixed reviews about this particular um, proposal. It's not yet a decision, it's a proposal. Uh, what are your views on that? I was expecting um, rather to have a strategy that mm. tells me or tells Ghana exactly what the Electoral Commission was doing to ensure that materials don't arrive late in places that they are supposed to. Mm. Also, all the logistics that they need are going to be in place. The fact that there are people who say their names are not on the register when they go to check, mm. what measures they are going to use to ensure that. Again, I would have loved to also hear about um, whether as a country we were going to revert to the November voting. Yeah, instead of December. Instead of December. But that be it, the Electoral Commission has announced this. What are they putting in place to ensure that even if you start at 7 and end at 4, we still don't end up sorting out and uh, counting into late in the night? Mm. Because that is what the Electoral Commission says it has concerns with in terms of security. So, um, um, so you are coming from the fact that they should correct the already existing problems uh, in, with, with better strategy instead of, I think, I think with you know, this... The, the, the litmus test is there. Mm. You have the district assembly elections coming off in November. Yeah. And so this would, this would be the actual test run for the general elections that come up right. next year, whether it's in November or December. We need to see as a country the lessons that the Electoral Commission has learned, yeah. the measures it has put in place, how successful those measures have been in rectifying the anomalies that we have experienced as mm. a people who vote. From there, then we can know what is going to happen. Mm. But this announcement for me is premature. Mm. Well, there are some people that uh, would say that they, they do have a point if they do institute this new proposal because when you go to some of the polling stations, in fact, most polling stations, you would see that uh, during the day, people do not come in to vote. And when it's about an hour at a time, that's when you see people queuing up to vote. And so this causes the voting uh, to go away into the night. And sometimes people have to volunteer their headlights of, of their vehicles, you know, to, to aid in the counting. So why not at 6 a.m.? Since a lot of people go in there mm. and queue from perhaps like 10 p.m. the previous day. Mm. So why not at 6 and at 3 if we are guarding against counting late into the night, yeah. looking out for security? Why not come early, close early, by 3 you have closed, by 5 if you are sorting out? Because remember, mm. some people would even be in the queue when you are closing. 
Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and then they even do the extension when, you know, some people feel disenfranchised and are not able to vote. And then so in other places... that's also another Yes, way and you of, have overseas, or what we have termed overseas, because some of mm. these places are hard to reach areas. Yes. We have had difficulty with the uh, materials reaching, reaching them. Reaching them on time. So in that sense, our concern will be, why not tell us how you are going to get all those people have the materials at the time when everybody is supposed to have hmm. start at the time that we are all supposed to start well i mean i think they may have you know some reasons that may not be pub uh, made public uh, perhaps maybe some security reasons or one or two other things that they're not telling us but my hope is that you know with all the mixed reactions that are coming up within the public sphere that they will take on board some of the cues that the ordinary Ghanaian you know has, has has put out there and then put them on board in this new strategy like we said it's 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 not yet instituted but you know there's a huge possibility because it's come up now and like you said it's, it's premature because they've talked about it, it's quite likely that this will come into force. Well, November comes, we have district level elections mm -hmm, coming off, mm -hmm. and um, let's le see what the Electoral Commission would do. Mm. If they are successful, we back them. If not, oh. unfortunately, the media is there. We would report it <laughs> and we will criticize. Always. <laughs> and not criticize just for criticizing sake, yeah. but we will offer them some solutions if they take them into consideration. That's good their, for us as yeah. a country. Well, I'm hoping that, you know, uh, going forward, our elections will be better conducted. Like you said, we've had anomalies since 1992, and um, hopefully these new reforms will be able to address some of these situations. So we're calling on to the Electoral Commission. If you're listening to us, um, there have been a lot of reaction. The Ordinary Ghanaian is talking, and uh, we hope that you take on board, you know, some of these suggestions, you know, that people have made, you know, to sort of construct a new strategy that will aid in bettering our electioneering process, especially the national ballot. So uh, this has been The Spin, and we will be right back after the break. You're welcome back from the break. This is still captured by women. Now, barely a week into the reopening of schools, some disgruntled members of the Ghana National Association of Teachers are still on strike, but the mother union disagrees with their action. We will delve into their concerns. With us today is Mr. Ahina Kwashi. He's the head of compensation and working conditions at the Ghana National Association of Teachers. Welcome to the show, Mr. Thank Kwashi. You. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Well, um, I think we should start off with um, the teachers from the six regions who are on strike. We understand that um, you at the national executive level are not in support of this. So would want to know, one, why you're not in support, and two, whether or not their uh, uh, concerns are legitimate or not. Thank you very much. Uh, in the first place, I think that the, their concerns might be legitimate, okay. but they have not gone through the due process. But NAT is a credible organization and we don't do things like that. Mm. So what is the credible uh, process that they have to go through? Now the credible process is that you should have negotiated this thing with your employer and come to a deadlock. Then you write to a National Labor Commission about your intention to go on strike. And the law says 14 days notice, right? And we have not done that. So they cannot come and then declare strike action. And in any case, the original chairman who did that, were they able to even consult with the original executives? Which I doubt very what? much that they didn't do that. What, what is your formal position on this as a national executives? Is there a strike action in the offing? Um, as, what's far your as, position? as far as I am concerned, the NAT has not declared any strike action. You okay. don't intend declaring any strike action? We may intend going forward, but now we have not declared any strike action. So these are legitimate concerns by your workers or by your members. Um, with such a concern, would you be sitting down for the situation to degenerate? Because other members might likely join this strike. 
we are not certain that there are processes that we are going through. Have you begun those processes? And we have begun that, those processes. That was the first one was last Tuesday when we had a press conference. And then we let the entire nation know about our situation. Oh. Right. We have done the first one. Today I have signed a letter on behalf of my general secretary to the National Labor Commission telling them about our intention to embark on, a, on an industrial action. Okay. Right. And then the press conference also, we indicated that the human resource management information system must be suspended to enable Ghana Education Service input all the promotion issues, salary arrears, and all. It's, it's interesting that you've mentioned that, sorry to cut you, but you know, we've had a lot of jargons being thrown around. We have the gift miss, we have the HRMIS, which you've just mentioned. I think it would be good for our viewers to really understand the entirety of of what this is about. Is it a software system? Is it a, a public sector reform thing? What's, what's all of that? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a public sector reform, which was carried out somewhere around 2012. The gift miss one, which is the Ghana Integrated Financial Management Information System, is the financial aspect. And that one is being implemented by Control and Accountant General's Department. Indeed, any ministry, department, or agency, all are on that platform. So if they want money, they go there and initiate the processes. Okay. Then the money is approved for them. Now, with regard to the Human Resource Management Information System, that is being implemented by Public Services Commission. That is the human resource aspect of these reforms. Indeed, we agree it's a very good project. We will support it. But in the design, Public Services Commission did not take our inputs into consideration. And that is why we have a problem with the what were system. the inputs that you made that were not taken into consideration? Thank you. You know, in, in, in the Ghana Education Service, or even in Ghana, it is only teachers that when they are promoted, their job does not change. For example, if a class one teacher is a principal subtenant and he's promoted to a standard director too, he still will still remain still a class, class one, one and teach. Mm. In GS, if you are doing the core business of teaching and you are promoted, your job does not necessarily change. Good. And they have designed the thing in such a way that, for example, let's say at the Braca Presby JHS, if there are five teachers, two of them are principal subtenants, two of them are standard director twos, and one is our standard director one, the system knows that these are the ranks of teachers at the Braca Presby JHS. So if one of the principal subtenants is promoted to a standard director two, it means that we are now having one principal subtenant two assistant directors, and then one director one, assistant director one. Now, when the GES people do their inputting, and then they forward, Public Service Commission will reject this teacher because at Adabraka Presby JHS, the, the system knows that we have two principal subtenants, we have two assistant director two, and one assistant director one. What then will happen is that Public Service Commission will have to create a vacancy and re additional vacancy for a standard director to and reduce the principal subtenant. And that takes a chunk of time. So since the inception of this program somewhere in August last year, that is the problems that we have gone through. And any time you tell them, they say they are resolving it, they are doing that and that kind of thing. And the problem has been with us. Do you not on think that they will still go ahead and say that all your concerns, you know, are, are being resolved or are being looked at? So you haven't it, seen any indication whatsoever? We have not seen that. Even yesterday, we had a meeting at the Ministry of Employment and, and Labor Relations where the chairman of the Public Services Commission was there, uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Ampedu Fofi, okay. right? And from all the things that she said, it appears that we have design problem. Okay. We have design problem. And that is why we are saying that the system must be suspended, maybe temporarily, for GES people to do all the things that they need to do so that our members will have their correct salaries. Because if you are promoted, you are pushed to a new grade. Mm. So once you, you are put there, then you have your new salary and then if there are any arrests then you have. Okay, so so that is what, why we are calling for the suspension of that program. Mm -hmm. And for that matter, we have given them two weeks. We have given them two weeks to do that. If after the two weeks and then they have failed to do it, 
then that is where we will be justified if we say we want strike. to embark on strike action. Okay. But Mr. Ahinokwa, they've also mentioned other things like um, there are books not being ready. They've also indicated deductions that have been made from their uh, um, salaries directly uh, into insurance and all that, and for which they claim that there was no consultation and an agreement to that effect. Thank you. Let me deal with the SIC one first. Okay. It is the employer who says they want to organize some kind of insurance uh, for their employees, yeah. which every employer can decide to do that. But in our case, it is insurance. It is not compulsory. So what we are telling the employer is that design registration forms and go out there and let the people sign on onto it. They did not heed our call. They went ahead and did a deduction. Now, controller, when they effect a deduction on behalf of a third-party institute, it is the third party that must refund the money and not controller. Because a controller but in doesn't this case, keep the it money. It is not the third party that went into It is the into third the... party, which is SIC, oh. and the employer who went in to effect that. Thing. Yes. So, what we are saying is that you, as an individual, go to the uh, 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 third party, which is SIC. And then demand your time. What, and in what documents do I have to go to yeah. uh, SIC to ask for? Exactly. A that is why we are. That is why we are. Th there is a form. Okay. They have. They have. They have prepared a form which is available at the district education offices and some places. Right. We even had some. We gave to our people. But the problem they are saying is that because they didn't fill any form, they don't want to fill any form again for the money. Oh. Then and it means that you've would got some redress, problem. but you're also being a little bit sticky about it. I mean, if you have a form and you can clearly go and get your money refunded, why not? Yeah, that is the challenge we have with some of our members. Mm. They say because they didn't fill any form, they don't want to fill any exit form. Ah, well, I don't but know those, that. we have information that those who have filled their, those exit forms, they have refunded they their money to them. Their money, At so. least if not all the contributions that they have made. Mm. You understand? Then the other issue has to do with the books. Yes. the books. This is not the first time we are having reforms in this country. And I remember in 1987 when we had the junior high school uh, reforms. Oh. Even those textbooks that initially they brought, they were full of mistakes. Look, and, and knowledge, knowledge doesn't change yeah. so much. The Archimedes principle, eh, which says that three, four, five. Nobody has changed that principle. Mm. So whether there are textbooks or not, once you have the syllabus, you can make do with the other textbook and go and find out if the, the, the teaching of Archimedes principle is there, we'll go and look for a textbook. Right. But if they want to insist, if we want to insist on textbooks before we go to the classroom to teach, we may not have it. And we may not even have, have. Now that we're talking about textbooks, do you think that the teachers are adequately trained to start you know, this new curriculum? Indeed. I could not participate in the kind of training that they gave to the teachers some few uh, weeks or months ago. Yeah. And even that well, our information is that there were some few lapses here and there. You sound as if this was done in isolation of, of, of your No, we were not there. I don't... I, that's why I'm saying that I was not around at that time. But I don't think that the union was really involved in, in the design and, and everything. Indeed, what happened was that it was after they had, they started the program, I think, either Monday or Tuesday. And then Friday, the GES invited us to a meeting. And that was where me, for the first time, I even heard about those challenges that they were facing in terms of food and all those yes, things. The uh -huh. TNT issues. The and TNT so issues and all those things. Uh, so, so this should be part of your grievances then, the fact that you were not really included in, in the training. The, the, I don't think this is, this is a major point for us to, no? to dwell on this. I don't think so. Okay. So That's this my is not, opinion. Okay. I don't think so. Anyway, so now there's an impasse. Your, you know, your members in six regions have gone on strike. You know, and um, this this standoff. How do you intend to resolve uh, but it? But it, ha, ha, have you gone out there to check whether the the, the schools are <laughs> closed? No, we haven't. I mean, yes, our information <laughs> is that the, the schools are are, are, are in session. Yes. yes. If anything at all, it's few of them who are taking this position, oh. and for that matter, they are not going to school. 
So will this be an issue of uh, an incidence of fake news or you know, uh, blowing I everything say, out of proportion? I wouldn't say so. Mm. I wouldn't say so. Uh, this uh, strike action that is um, supposedly you know, still going on at this time, this illegal strike action, uh, we've, we've heard and seen in the news that uh, it's because some head teachers were demoted because they, they received money or they collected money from pupils for the third term, printing for the third term examinations from, uh, from last academic year. Um, how far is this, um, is this true at all? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I've forgotten the date, but I remember the day that we had the lunch of the, what is it, the, is it the Ghana teacher also? Ghana Prize, that, 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 that what we normally we used to call it the best teacher award. Yeah. Good. Then the incident had happened, and we had gone to see the Director General and pleaded. So that same morning, we had a meeting where all the 110 teachers or so were right. invited to our NAT from headquarters West, is it? from Ga West. Right. And then we pleaded with GES management to, I mean, this is from going ahead with their demotion. Mm. And they agreed, the Director General agreed. But what he told us was that the decision was taken at the GS Council. Okay. And therefore, he was instructed to write to say that they were going to demote their people. So with our plea, what he is going to do is that he's going to report back to the GS Council at their next meeting. Mm. And then the action that he has taken, and they also take on board our plea. And once they agree that the demotion exercise should be suspended, then they will suspend it. This is punitive. Are you saying that people shouldn't be punished for, you know, flouting regulations? I'm not saying people should not be punished. Yeah. That's not what I have said. Because we are members, we tell them that once government is implementing free education, you don't have to go in and take any money. Yes. But we have, we have recalcitrant ones who will do that. And once they do it and it comes to our attention, we have to go and then plead. And that is exactly what we did. And GS management accepted our plea. Mm. What they did is what has even infuriated them. And I don't know how the data general is going to react. Because they, the teachers themselves, the head teachers themselves were aware. We brought all of them to Nile headquarters that day mm. and dealt with this issue. So we are only waiting for the meet, next meeting of the GS council, the, what the data general will tell them and their response. And then we communicate to them. Well, we, so, we, we, we have to, okay, if you have a last question. No, no I, I was to just... Round up. <laughs> <laughs> Carry on. Well, you've that. indicated a 14-day uh, notice. I, yeah. the, the question is, what happens if you don't get a meeting? And if you get a meeting, what are your expectations for that meeting? No, our expectation is that this human resource management information system will be suspended. And we want this to be suspended so that GES will use the, what is available and what is the IPPD to, to do all these things that we are talking about. Once these things are done, then they can invite us. Because yesterday, at yesterday's meeting, the chairman of the Public Services Commission herself admitted that there are serious design challenges that we have to go back to the table and then rectify them. Well, so if in 14 days it's not rectified? No, we will definitely communicate to, to the media and, and the entire nation. No, it depends on the decision the national executive <laughs> will take. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for being with us. This Thank has been you. very informative. Thank we hope you. we can have you here back again, you know, when we do have other issues to discuss Anytime that have to do with the Ghana time. National Association of Teachers. So Mr. Hinakwa Kwashi is the head of compensation and working conditions at the Ghana National Association of Teachers. We wish you well uh, with your, your, all, all of your concerns. We're hoping that the government will listen to you and uh, solve all your problems. And thank you for, yeah, for sharing with us. What, what I also know is that government had already uh, released an amount of over 49 million for the payment of uh, transfer grants uh, and other allowances, TNTs and other guys' allowances and other things. So that's a step forward. That's a, it's a step forward in the right direction. Great. So thank you for sharing with us and for explaining all of these things that were confusing us a little bit. Um, um, our guest, Mr. Ahinakwa Kwashi, is the head of compensation and working conditions at the Ghana National Association of Teachers. Um, we wish you well in your, in your, your strike action or whatever it is uh, you're going forward with to make sure that your concerns are addressed by Thank government. You. We will be right back. Thank you.
So there have been several allegations of corruption leveled against some government officials. But how is government taking this? We have in here Herbert Krapa, government spokesperson on governance and legal affairs to discuss this issue. How well are you reacting to allegations of corruption against some members of government? Thank you very much and um, thank you for, for having me. Say, it's my first time on the show. Uh, thank You're you. <laughs> uh, how government is reacting to the allegations of corruption that is being leveled against um, the government of the day is an important question. Mm. But it is important more if it dovetails into how we are showing the measures that we are putting in place to ensure that the fight against corruption is being tackled head on. And that is why the president chose the forum of the uh, Bar Conference to discuss the issue of corruption allegations. We should make sure that we are not focusing on mere allegations, but we are looking into allegations that have evidence which will be investigated and if persons, appointees are found culpable, the president has demonstrated that he's not going to shield anybody. He is going to make sure that the laws of the land work. The president has not taken the bold step to empower institutions of state for nothing. The president has not taken the bold step of setting up the office of the special prosecutor for nothing. Um, for the first time in the history of our country, we are resourcing the state agencies that are responsible for the fight against corruption. Um, the Auditor General, Mr. Dumelovo, is on record to have said that never in the history of the, 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 the institution have they seen such resources at their disposal. Year after year, since President Kufuado took office, in the first year, you saw a 25% increment in their budgetary allocation. In the second year, you've seen a 34% increment. And the story runs through Parliament, Shiraj, Office of the Attorney General, and all of them. I mean, but do you, so do you find, do you find these um, allegations baseless? Um, looking at the fact that some investigations have gone into some of these allegations, but the reports are never published. I think we should look at that question uh, carefully. You know, there are different kinds of inquiries. There's one that is a public inquiry, mm -hmm. where it's either, still either held in camera or it's held in the open. And then there's one that, the ones that you really have the security agencies investigating. The norm has not been for those ones, the reports to be made public. Where it is a, a public uh, uh, inquiry, then the president has a choice in the constitution whether to make it public or to issue a white paper. Even that, but you understand. You know what, Mr. Krapa, to add to what Tilly just, you know, uh, inquired, it's, it must be so overwhelming, you know, these allegations. You have jargons like one day, one scandal. You know, it's, it must be really overwhelming. You know, we're getting a lot of all these things coming up each and every other day. The, the question should be, does the government have a difficulty, really, in letting us know openly, you know, why some of these people who are accused are cleared, for example? Is there a difficulty there? The government doesn't have any difficulty, and the president has been emphatic that he has not cleared anyone. It is the institutions of state. When Barack Obama came to our country and emphasized that... We should empower institutions and not men. This is exactly what he meant. But, but you see, that's, that's where you have um, some concerns. One, you have institutions. For instance, the special prosecutor has said that there are some areas that he cannot go because of certain judgments that have come. That indicated that he could not, ju uh, he could not go into investigations where you have... Um, Conflict of interests, for instance. And then you also have government posture that has come. So you have the institutional bit. And then, so these are two questions that I'm coming with. You have the institutional bit and then you have the government posture where you're saying that it is not your uh, responsibility. It is institutional responsibility. But then day in, day out, it looks like every institution that every case goes to, even if it looks interestingly 
or mm -hmm. seemingly glaring always comes with what now has become in the um, public parlance the clearing house. Yeah. The person is cleared. I think we should be factual rather than sentimental. If the allegations have been brought to the fore, persons are invited and they are not able to substantiate the allegations with any evidence. I don't think that, I, then I think we are inviting ourselves into the arena where people shout on the rooftop and then people are clear. But the president has also demonstrated that in some instances, prima facie evidence before him may not require him to wait for an investigation before he asks the people to step aside. He has done that with the Public Procurement Authority. He has done that with the National Youth Authority, where before investigations will go into the matter, looking at the evidence before him, he would say that the, the appointment of these CEOs should be terminated immediately and the investigation should continue. And if any criminality is found, the, the prosecution should continue. So about far, that, been, that, sorry not to cut you, but that school, there's a school of thought that says that when a person is not suspended, then they cannot be cleared. So when you clear them, then you have a chance to, when you suspend the person, then you have a chance to clear the person or otherwise convict the person. What I'm not, do you sure, make I'm of not that? sure I understand. Some people you. are saying that when you, when you suspend a person, for example, the head of the public procurement agency, yes. then you have an opportunity to clear the person eventually. But when the person is not suspended and is just sacked, then, then you, you know, have there's we no. Lost faith <laughs> well, in the this is going well. Of state. I'm talking about the office of the special prosecutor. Mm. I'm talking about. In many respects, Mr. Martin Amidu, yes. I'm talking about the Commission for Human Rights and Administrative Justice. The President has referred a single matter to these two institutions. Mm. In the matter of conflict of interest to Shraj, in the matter of criminality, sale of contracts and some uh, alleged um, 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 un untoward dealings in contracts uh, to the Office of the, 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 the Special, special. Prosecutor. Mm. I think we should be patient wait for what Mr. Martin Amidu has to say, mm. wait for what Shraj has to say, and then we would see the action, whether or not the president would follow <laughs> the recommendations of these institutions. But Mr. Crapper, let me ask a question. You just asked us mm -hmm. a question, a rhetorical one, which mm -hmm. said, have you lost that much confidence in the institutions? Won't you be concerned if you start hearing, or as you hear now, that the, the citizenry is now asking, mm -hmm whether this is not all these cases and these referrals are not any of those clearing issues because honestly those are the concerns out there i'm happy if the concerns are genuine i'm i'm disturbed if it is an attempt to relentlessly throw mud at the sitting government mm. orchestrated deliberately by the opposition and unfortunately, is gathering momentum. And, that and, and, and continually, n not just the MPP, but also the NDC, since the two of you are the only ones who have been in power so far from the 1992 mm -hmm. um, era. Dispensation. Yes, dispensation. Each and every one of you, anytime you are in power, say that your people are not the corrupt people. But once you are in opposition, you are the one who lead the citizenry right. into singing the corruption or the corrupt song for officials in power. So how do you then turn back to help the citizenry get confidence in the very institutions that when you come into power, you establish? I think what is important, and it's a, and it's a good question that you have asked, I think what is important is for us to, to determine, for us to have a dispassionate analysis of whether the leadership of the day seems to be committed to the fight against corruption. I'll give you an example. In the past, in the recent past, we've had a situation where um, the question of corruption could not be discussed at the highest level. And it would affect the confidence that the institutions of state would have in helping central government fight the canker. To the extent that when the certain president then, John Mahama, was asked the question whether he's been corrupt before, it was a difficult moment for him that he would be asking whether the, it is a question posed in his private capacity or in his capacity as a, a public officer. Here today, we have a sitting president, Nana Kufuadu, who the week before he got the opportunity of addressing the bar conference, 
noticed that there had been some attempt to heighten the uh, corruption tag on his government. And he said, no, let's face the question frontally. Let's put before the Ghanaian people what we are doing to fight the canker. Philip, bear time? in mind, mm -hmm. I'm sorry to cut you, bear in mind that what we are talking about is not a situation where you say that you come into government, mm. you have appointed apostles, and so for eight years, 16 years, four years, 12 years, you will not have a single situation where someone is alleged to have been engaged in an act that is corrupt. Is it not time for you to have a bipartisan conversation and say that as a country and with all of us as political entities, we are going to have to agree and say that politics aside, corruption is not going to be something that we are going to be using for um, campaigning, but it's something that we are going to work on collectively mm. to save the country's purse, rather than for us to be throwing the mud at each other when we find ourselves yeah. in the positions to do that because it favors us for our campaigns to get into power. I think the fight against it's corruption... constantly done. And it's, it's, you, you mentioned that we should be dispassionate about this. So isn't it time that we stop politicizing? I think that the fight against corruption must go beyond rhetoric so that, like we have today, we clearly see a precedent, Nana Kufuado, putting together the foundation for enhancing and strengthening institutions, the institutions of state, to help fight corruption. See one thing that he did. The appointment of the Auditor General. You notice the timing of the appointment of the Auditor General. President Ekufuado comes in and says, hey, excellent. This is a person that was appointed by my previous, the previous president. But that's good. Let him stay in office. Let's empower him. Let him go after anyone that is engaged in activities that is bleeding the public purse. So what I'm saying is that the foundation that is being laid by the current president, Ekufuado, is good. And it is good if we can support him. And when succeeding governments come, they should not torpedo that um, uh, foundation that is being laid down. And I'm sure we can make progress in the fight against corruption. You've seen the latest Transparency International report. Yeah, the global corruption. Uh, yes, corruption and you've seen that it mm. indicates that some steady work is being done uh, in the fight against corruption. When in 2015, respondents were asked, is the government doing a good or bad job of fighting corruption? That's important, Tilly. It's important because you must demonstrate that you are against it and you are fighting it. In 2015, 25% of the respondents thought the government was doing a good job. In 2019, 60% thought that the government was doing a good job in fighting corruption. But I think that the data for this index was collected between 2016 and 17. So yes. it doesn't really um, project what persists today in terms of, as far as corruption is, is concerned. I don't think that if anything has changed, it is that the president is actually further enhancing the institutions of state to fight the corruption. And I've mentioned to you that here is the, a president who, when he came into office, the right to information bill, which had been in the works for 18 years, moved speedily to make sure that it would become law and, and, and as accented and, and, and to it. And that's where, interestingly, um, you, you, the government seems to enjoy some kind of goodwill when it comes to um, the media because of the issues related to um, the rights information bill, uh, the government's the fight prosecutor. to mm -hmm. end uh, criminal libel and all that. Yeah. The same president. But again, the media would also say that it's also been attacked somehow. And um, the president made a reference to it at the bar conference, where um, people who had come out with um, allegations or have uh, come out with some issues related to corrupt officials have found themselves to be under threat. Um, how are you working with the media to ensure that such people who blow the whistle or who kind of give you information that at the end, if you fight and you are successful, would make you rather look good in the mm. eyes of the Ghanaian? How are they protected? Because they feel threatened. 
the, the media, you know, the fourth estate of the realm, we can't do much without the media, without the strict lenses of the media on the other arms of government helping to, to, to govern a, a nation. And therefore, anything that, that would help in, in protecting the media and creating the atmosphere fertile enough for the media to continue with its job is, 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 is something that the government of the day should do. The current president is someone that is very big on rights and liberties, freedoms. He says that he would rather have a careless media than have one that is gagged. Mm. I think that his appointees and the, and the, and the, and the security agencies um, should take a cue from the, the posturing of the president when it comes to the media and uh, know how they will handle the media, uh, especially in the line of their work. It is unfortunate, the incidents that have come up, it's unfortunate. They keep occurring year after year. And I would call on the security agencies and all agencies responsible to be careful in how they handle the media. Because without the media, how are we going to be able to put to bear you, whatever but, the government but, but is But mind doing? you, this is not perception. These are actually incidents that have happened. So I that's think what, exactly that, what I'm uh, condemning. I'm, yes. moving, I'm going beyond perception. I'm condemning it anyway. in no uncertain terms that uh, mm. it is not proper. Mm. Um, it should be condemned. The media should have a free space to be able to perform the a very important duty mm. of being the fourth estate of the realm and, and keeping the government on its toes. But let me take you back quickly. Um, yes. You mentioned the RTI, yes, uh, which is important for us. And then uh, in the beginning of this conversation, you mentioned that uh, some of the cases were subject to public inquiry yes. and some weren't. So which, which, which sorts of cases uh, should be looked at publicly and which cases should not? What, what, what qualifies a case to be a public inquiry? Well, you know, case. well, well I, I think it's, um, and that's a, it's some, um, something for thought in our constitutional jurisprudence. Mm. Sometimes you choose the route of a, a commission of inquiry, for instance, mm. but we've seen from the judgment in Recobra Bay that perhaps the route of a public inquiry may handicap you in prosecuting the persons that you are found culpable of any wrongdoing. So it's a question of uh, walking a fine line between which approach you want to use, bearing in mind the consequences that, that you, you ha the, the end game that you have at the back of your mind. But clearly, once you move to the arena of the BNI, the CID, the Office of the Special Prosecutor, Attorney General's Department, you have prosecution at the back of your mind. Yep. And once the investigation demonstrates that some culpability is, is, is at play, prosecution should, should flow and, and but people you know, should... these are where they're clearing... Mm -hmm. at, at, at <laughs> these are cases that everybody seems to be on the same page on. I mean, it's, uh, I, I, don't, I do not know about some sort of influence that could handicap a commission of inquiry or anything like that. But I mean, causing financial loss to the state is, is, is a problem for everybody. And we all agree that anyone who causes financial loss to the state should, you know, be prosecuted in a way, or investigated at least. I think we should be on the same page on the part of the evidence. Mm. I think that's what is important. Speaking I think, as a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I think beyond the allegations, beyond the accusations, right. I think what we should be on the same page on is the evidence. Mm. And if it is overwhelming and glaring, the action would be taken against the people who are found culpable. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Tilly, just before you go, I, I think I want to know, I think that our, our viewers would want to know what your perception of corruption is in Ghana, your personal perception. I think I'm happy that the president is laying a solid foundation in the fight against corruption. It's a very political answer. I think, <laughs> I think empowering institutions of state hmm. to help the central government fight corruption regardless yeah. of which political parties in power is the way we should go and i'm happy that it is this president that is leading that charge mm. because he has demonstrated to all of us that if he has extra cash in his hands he would invest it in the human capital of our country Steve. we should support him <laughs> uh, we should have confidence in the institutions of our country and i'm sure the ghanaian people would eventually 
uh, feel excited about the gains that we will make. Still very political, but I think uh, we'll take it like that, as <laughs> most Ghanaians would say. Thank you very much, Herbert Krapa, Thank you um, very much. government spokesperson on governance and legal affairs. Thank you. We've discussed the issue of corruption tag on some officials of the present administration. We'll be right back. You're welcome back from the break. You're still watching Captured by Women. So Tilly, affectionately called Tilly, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Matilda, what is your highlight for today? What really the, got the, you? The Ghana National Association of Teachers mm. and its six regions, um, they declare um, a strike. Mm -hmm. And then the National Association declares um, an intention mm -hmm. for a strike mm -hmm. in two weeks. That's very interesting. Parallel actions. Parallel actions. Mm. Interestingly, they have the same concerns, but the processes are what they are fighting mm. over. I would hope that whatever their decision is, they take into consideration the current situation of the pupil or the student and uh, make sure that they work with their stakeholders as well as the authorities mm. to put those concerns behind them, address them. I think that they are very interesting um, issues because when it comes to the issue of promotions and money, yeah. money is what drives the individual, especially motivates. And drives the economy. And drives the economy. <laughs> but above all, it motivates the individual. Right. And we have a new system that we are trying to run. And so it, 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 it needs all hands on deck mm. to be able to run it successfully. I'm impressed with uh, the way that the government is, you know, computerizing everything with the selection of students, with managing, you know, the teachers or let's say employees under the government sector. So, I mean, it's a great move in the right direction. It's just that, you know, some, um, you know, uh, suggestions and things have to be put on board from the people on the ground in the field to help, you know, build or design or let's say better design some of these systems to cater for everybody. But what particularly got me was um, the conversation we had on corruption. You know, the, the corruption index is out, uh, the seventh round uh, from, from Transparency International. And um, the, the data that was collected actually for this particular round was done between uh, the years of 2016 and 17. So I personally do not think that it reflects the perception, the corruption perception that persists currently on, on our political landscape or our governmental landscape. But um, I'm, 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 I'm happy that, you know, the results of that index have sort of shown us that, you know, we're working or we're doing something about corruption. It's not necessarily a huge step, but it looks as if we have a 5 to 10 percent decrease in corruption perception, which is a good thing for things like foreign direct investment, you know, for how generally people outside of this country look at us, you know. Yeah, but but, but I, I, I would appreciate a situation where we stop using that as a campaign message mm. and um, go in a bipartisan manner yes. to deal with the issues of corruption. Then we would have, as a citizenry, the confidence that we need to have in the, the institutions. institutions. Because for now, you see a kind of um, um, struggle between some institutions, mm. for instance, who will tell you that I have been mandated to do this, but there's a judgment that restricts me. So it looks like you have held my hand at my back, mm. but you're, you're asking, asking me, me to, to fight. Right. So how do I fight this mm -hmm. course? So we need to move forward as a people rather than as a, um, when, when it suits you best, it, someone is corrupt, when it doesn't suit you, the person, you are not corrupt. Mm. Let's move forward as a people, save the national purse, deal with uh, issues of development because when we save the money, we are able to address to issues of forward, concern. Yeah. There are a lot of needs of... Especially the social uh, necessities, so, yes. you know, social services. And, uh, and if we are able to do that, then you better the uh, life of the ordinary Ghanaian. Right. What we need is money in our pockets, able mm. to re refer to institutions or go for services in institutions without having to think about who do I know there. Yes. I don't need to know anybody. Or think about putting, you know, stuffing something in an envelope to, you know, persuade somebody to do their job, mm -hmm. more or less. Well, viewers, you've heard it. Uh, you know, let's get dispassionate about corruption. 
let's uh, be non-partisan about corruption and let's deal with the matter head on. It is said that the average Ghanaian is corrupt. I do not think that um, this is well speaking of, of us as Ghanaians. So um, if you have committed an act of corruption consciously or unconsciously, well, you need to do a reflection and let's get over this canker, especially in the government sector. This show has been sponsored by Raid Mosquito Repellent Day and Night Spray, Emerald Suites in Cantonments, Woudin, Woudin Le Createur. You can see us wearing our Woudin beautifully. My outfit was made by Millie K up in Dakuman in Accra. And mine by Dash Fashion at Alaji Tabora in the Greater Accra region. And um, we say a very big thank you to our technical crew and also our makeup. Yes, at the Media General Makeup Department, you're doing a terrific job. Shout out to you. And have a pleasant weekend. So from the Emerald Suites in Cantonment, Accra, join us again next week, same time for Captured by Women. Goodbye.